Our scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Peter 4, 12, and 13. It says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fury trial, which is to try you, and as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may, be also, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. May the Lord add a blessing unto his word. Amen. At this time, we'll sit and go into our lesson study. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We meet another Sabbath again. Praise God. Today is another interesting lesson that we're going to be studying, the crucifolds that come. No, we pray, but I'd like to have a little word of prayer before we start. Thank you, Father God, for another day of life that you have granted us to live. We pray, Father, that as we review this lesson, that the spirit of your son, even the spirit of Christ, will be upon us to understand your goodness and mercy toward us as we study the things that we go through, knowing that this is just you refining us to make us a people for your glory. Thank you. In Christ Jesus' name I say that. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> I hope you are doing your lessons the more that you do your lessons, the better it gets. I found a lesson the other day, and uh, it had nothing written on it, and I said, wow, they're missing out. Because when you do your lesson, you can always discover the good things that God has prepared for us. That's why we have to do the lesson. Let us not just say, well, this is to come every seven to entertain ourselves. Because this entertainment, if you want to call it that, is for life. And that life is everlasting, so let us enjoy the lessons as we study and as we gather together to ask the Lord's blessings. Well, we already read about the self, to be partakers of the sufferings of Christ. What, what can that mean for you to be partakers of the sufferings of Christ? I mean, how can we compare our sufferings to the sufferings of Christ? Now, last week's lesson was about the shepherd's rod, right? Today, we come to the explanation of, a, of what a crucifix is, and it tells us that a crucifix is... kind of a molding that they put in it stream heat to melt a metal. Now I used to be a burner, steel burner, and some metal does not burn, it melts. You try to burn it and it keeps uh, welding itself together again because you cannot set it apart. So here, and this container represents the trials, temptations, tribulations that we go through, sort of uh, purifying the growth out of our lives. The question is, can we stand the heat? Now, there's different parables that the Lord Jesus gave about where the seed fell. And as you know, a lot of the seed perish. They couldn't take the refiner's heat. So they withered away. They left. I don't want to do that. I don't want to stop doing this or this, that, and that. So they refuse to go through the process to take everything that doesn't belong there from the way that we used to dress or the way that we used to eat or the way that we used to talk. Some just don't want to change that lifestyle. 
So when they go through a little test process, they leave the church. They didn't leave God, they left the church. Because you could leave the church and not leave God. Okay? Say, how can that be? Well, a lot of us have maybe left the church and then we came back. Because God is working with us. He had to take us out of that heat, put us over here to cool down, and then he brings us back. See? So it's like a back and forth, like a lukewarm state of mind. So then they, the, in the process, we decide, well, do I stay or do I leave? Now, one time the Lord put his disciples through that test. I said, do you remember, because I know you read the scriptures, but do you remember when the Lord Jesus told them, I am the bread of life? And the people wanted to leave? And he told the disciples, are you going to leave also? And Peter said, where can we go? You have the bread of life. So that's what happens to us in the process. Like, if we leave the Lord, where, let us be honest, where are we going to go? Because wherever we go, the Lord is going to be there with us. Wherever we accept it or not, we know now, because we are like God. Do you know that? That we are like God's? Because now we know good and evil. You remember that? Oh, you shall be like God. And then God says, now man have become like us, knowing good and evil. Not like that we are like God. I'm talking about the knowledge of good and evil. We know what's good and what's bad. So there's a battle there. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, you said something now that people are leaving the church. Uh, this leads us to a very important aspect. This week's lesson talks about various crucibles. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, but somehow, what you just said is very, very relevant. Uh, I don't know how it is not covered in the lesson, that crucible. And you just mentioned it. It's somewhat related to what I'm going to say now, called crucible of comfort. Comfort, you know, we want to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. The moment we have a little bit of uneasiness, little bit of sacrificing, we leave. So that's a very relevant crucible. You know, crucible of comfort. Maybe it's in the lesson. We still got what, like uh, 12 more to go, 11 <laughs> more to go. Maybe it's in there. Who knows? Well, thank you. Now here in the lesson it says, uh, on Sunday, these definitions also give us a helpful insight into what happens to our spiritual lives. This week, we will highlight some reasons we may suddenly find ourselves under pressure and experience, experiencing tests and places in which circumstances cause us to change, develop, and grow in character. This will help to give us an awareness of what God is doing in our lives so that when we enter a crucible, we will have an idea of how to respond. Let me, let me ask you a little question. I'll say, do you remember? Do you remember when Israel went into the crucible of the battle with the Philistines and everybody was afraid of Goliath? And then came this little young man ready to battle. Do you remember what the king, after he said, I'll fight, and after he said all that, what did the king give David? Do you recall what the king gave David? Armor. That's found in 1 Samuel 17, 57, I mean 37 and 59. He gave him his armor. But what happened in that crucible? When David found himself in that crucible that he was going to wear somebody else's armor, what happened? Well, David told him, look, I have not tried this armor. That's why when we're going through trials and temptations and tribulations in our lives, we wonder, 
like the verse says, what is happening to me? Because we don't fit that mold. We don't fit in that armor. If you follow the thought. So if we want to battle in that crucible that doesn't fit right, and we're going through trials and temptations, tribulations that we call upon ourselves for some reason, how do we get out of that? Well, David told the king, I have not tried that armor. It's too big for me. I'm not going to use it because I don't know how it works, so to speak. Now, when we're going through the trials and tribulations, now we have another armor on because now we have put on the armor of God. We have put on Christ. Now, Christ is the perfect crucible that we could suffer with him, go through it, and know that we're going to come out clean on the other side because he's purifying us as gold. It's tried seven times, so it's a silver. Silver and gold, both are tried. So when we put the armor of God, we could go through that crucible because now we are fit to go through the fire. And I'll go a little forward later, so keep that in mind, that when we put on Christ, we can overcome the crucibles that may come in our lives. But like Brother Nelson always says, we need that personal relationship to understand what's happening to us when we're going through those trials. We have to know. And one of the things that we know in Sunday's lesson is, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning fiery trials, which, I mean, uh, yeah, which is to try you as though something uh, happened to you. So he is said to try you. Now, what's going on in this word try? Now, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, it tells us what? It tells us that the devil went to make who? War against the remnant of her seed. So when we're going through crucibles in our lives, we have to remember somebody doesn't want us to go to heaven. Someone doesn't want us to be obedient to God. Someone claims us as his own from the Garden of Eden. So he's claiming us again unto himself, as it were. So Satan is claiming his own, just like God is claiming his own. So there's a battle going on. There's a battle going on. And that battle is going on in the crucible. Because in the crucible, there, through, the, through what's going on, or either you get out, you stay in to be purified. Because at the end of the day, it's going to be a battle in there until the Lord Jesus comes. We're going to be in a battle, and the battle is going to get worse. Sometimes everything goes so nice and church was so good. You go home and the whole world comes on you. Things go bad. You say, what happened? I was singing and rejoicing God and now what's going on here? Something could happen. The devil could turn your son, your daughter, your wife, your friend, break the TV. You know, any, anything to, to discourage you. Anything. So we have to remember that when we study the word of God, this word is telling us the process that is going in that crucible, the heat that is going in there. Let me tell you another story. Do you remember? And I said, do you remember? Because everybody here is here, <laughs> meaning in the church or the age, supposed to know. Do you remember somebody got a little upset because they did not worship his image, the idol that he had made? Chakra, Major, and Amendigo. Did they go in there? If somebody went to the fiery trials, it was them. I mean, they went in there. True story. A lot of people say, I don't believe that. It could not be true. Well, by faith we believe that it is truth. Or it was truth. But it's true because it's still happening today, sort of. The question is, who was there with them? 
the Lord Jesus was there with them. And he will be with us and he is with us in our trials. But we need to trust that he is there. By faith, we have to see the unseen to realize that he is there with us. But we must believe because as we spoke before, it is impossible to please God without faith. So we have to believe that he is and he's a rewarder. Okay? So he rewards us when we believe. And that is something nice to know. That, and I, uh, I think it's Nehemiah, it says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. You heard, you heard what that said? It said, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. How can that be? Well, when we resist the devil and he will flee from you, as the lesson points out, when we resist the devil, we're making God happy. If you follow the thought of the joy of the Lord, we are making God happy that we're fighting the good fight. So the joy of the Lord is my strength. If you follow the thought. So when we obey, we make God happy. Because at the same time, happy is the people whose God is the Lord. So everybody will be happy in the middle of trials, tribulation, or whatever we might be going through. We could be happy because we know what's going on. It's not like we mentioned last Sabbath, why is this happening to me? But we know why it's happening to me. Because the word of God tells us, or it is written, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony or the faith of Jesus Christ. So we know who we are and why we are going through this because the devil, your adversary of the devil, is as a rolling lion seeking him to devour. But at the same time, the devil was wrapped with the woman and went to make war against God's people. So we have to understand and be awake and vigilant, sober, be vigilant. Remember those words from Peter? Because we have to understand what's going on in our lives. Now here, and it asks the question, what is Peter's message concerning the strange things happening to you? In my answer, I wrote that we need to fight the good fight no matter what may come. We need to be faithful to the word of God. But to be faithful to the word of God, we have to know the word of God. How do we know the word of God? How do we know the Lord Jesus? Well, he could reveal himself to us, which he does through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Now, there's an interesting question here in the, in, on Sunday. It speaks about, let, let me read a little bit. Many of us are surprised about suffering because we often are of a simplified view of the Christian life. We know there are two sides, God who is good and Satan who is bad. But often we then automatically put everything that feels good in the box with God and everything that feels bad in the box with Satan. But life is not so simple. We cannot use our feelings to decide what is in God's box or Satan's box. Sometimes walking with God can be challenging and hard. And following Satan can appear to bring great reward. Job who is righteous yet suffering illustrate this when he asks God why do the wicked live on growing old and increasing in power how can you as a class answer that question and the Bible gives you the answer why do the wicked live growing old and increasing in power how can, how can that be you see the poor suffering what the wicked prosper. As God's people, where do we go to, to get the answer to that? I went there. I found the answer. It's in the Bible. Yeah. 
Where can you possibly find the answer to why do the wicked live on, growing old, and increasing power? <laughs> well, we see all this happening to the wicked, and we ask why. But now we have to look a little closer behind the picture of the fiery trials, the temptations. But besides all this, there's a reward. There's a reward to all this. Do you see the rich man prosper? And where do we find that reward for the wicked? In Psalms 73, it tells you about the story of the wicked. And then the psalmist says, Then I went into the sanctuary. So when you go into the sanctuary and you study the sanctuary, okay, you find out the reward of the wicked. Their reward is in the sanctuary. Because that's exactly where we are now. We are in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We are in the heavenly sanctuary. And judgment is going on. So we're not just here sitting when nothing is happening up there. There's a judgment going on for the wicked and for the righteous. That's why when the Lord Jesus comes, he comes with the reward. Because if there was no judgment going on, how can he give out the rewards? So here's the... the so why do the wicked prosper? Well, God lets them prosper. Do you know that a lot of wicked people prosper and yet, uh, I'll say, the poor will get the benefits of it? Because a lot of wicked people might be the very ones giving you a job. Have you ever thought about that? So that's why we need to pray for one another, even them. Because as you continue the lesson, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So anyway, in the, in the, in the lesson, that's what we find. So there's a question here <clears throat> about how to respond uh, should be surprised at painful trials that might face. Then, in, like I said, in Romans 12, 17, it says, how do you explain this to people? And then we need to know how to explain the reason for pain and suffering. We need to know why people are going through pains and suffering. Yes, sister. Testing. Okay. Yes, I just also wanted to make one point about this lesson and that last paragraph that we read. We have to be careful not to fall into the trap of believing in the prosperity gospel, of not believing that if I serve God more or if I go to church more, if I pray more, then my life is gonna, if I become a Christian or if I follow God, then I'm gonna have like this prosperous life. I'm gonna have a wonderful job a wonderful family, and my life is just gonna be so perfect and easy. And we have to warn our family and friends that when we're talking to them about Christ, that it's not always going to be easy. There are gonna be some times where you're gonna cry out to God and say, why are these things happening to me? And two, when sometimes when I'm watching the TV, I don't know if you ever seen the commercials, where um, the pastors are selling the, um, the holy water. And then the people are saying, oh, I bought the holy water, and then the next day I got $10,000 in the check. I got $30,000 in the check. I got a new job, right? And that's selling a false um, image of what Christ is about, that if you accept me as your Lord and Savior, you know, your life is just going to become perfect, you're gonna be happy all the time, you know what I'm saying? And you're never gonna have any type of suffering. And then when a person, as soon as they experience that suffering, then they walk away from God. 
because it's like, well, God doesn't really love me or God doesn't really care about me because if he did, then X, Y, and Z would not have happened to me. So we also have to be careful not to fall in that and to warn our family and friends of that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. As you're speaking, I'm thinking that, even though we mentioned, I think, last Sabbath, but something that we do not hear them say is Matthew 6.33, I think it is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But when I say seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we spoke last Sabbath about what righteousness is. Thy law is righteousness. So when it comes to the law, now when, when believe it or not, when you go into the crucifix and to that molding, what you're going to find in there that is heating it up is the law of God. Because the Lord, our God, is a consuming fire. And when we are in the presence of the Lord, he's going to do away with that sin in us if we really want to. Remember what Peter said when he was drowning? Save me, Lord. So that's why we're going to be crying in there. Save me, Lord, because we don't want these sins in our lives. So we're asking God to lead me to repentance, which is exactly what he's doing in that crucible. He's, because... And there is the path of life in there. We, we are walking in there. Okay. This is an interesting uh, thing here on Monday. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a rolling lion seeking who he might devour. Now, vigilant is uh, keeping a careful watch. We have to be careful. Wow. Where do you think, I mean, this is me thinking, okay, so you could agree or disagree, but where do you think that Job, I mean, Job, ah, I gave the answer. Where do you think that Peter got that from? Well, the answer is from Job. Remember when the sense of God went up to heaven and God asked Job, where, I mean, God asked Satan, where do you come from? Can anybody remember what Satan told God that he was doing? The same word is there, walk. Job, let's see, let's see, uh, let's see if I find Job here. Let me see what Job 1. Job 1, 7 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Where is come thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. Have things changed? No, Satan's still going about who he might destroy and devour. Yes, he is. Okay, can somebody read for us Philippians 4, 4 through 7? And that is to answer a little question here that says, in the above text, what message there is for us? Ask yourself, how seriously do I take these words? What thing do you do in your life that shows whatever you take them seriously? Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Anybody has it? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there's any virtue in anything praiseworthy, meditate on all these things. Thank you. So, when we come to your seriousness, of these verses, 
we have to compare scripture with scripture how to answer. Because do you remember these words? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So when there's a question asked, usually the answer is in the book. It's there to respond. When the enemy attacks us, we cannot just run away. We have to face him because he's chasing us and we have to face him. That's what Israel did when the enemy was attacking and they were afraid and then they overcame the, that, the power that was overcoming them, meaning Goliath. And when he cut his head off, he did away with that sin. They all ran, and Israel was running after them. So when you see a brother find victory, join in his victory. Okay? Then again, the brother just prayed. One of the things that we have to do is come to God with supplications and prayer. The word of God in Isaiah 26, 3 tells us, Perfect peace have they whose mind has stayed in thee because they put their trust in him. So we need to have that peace. When we're going through these trials and tribulation, we cannot freak out. We have to say God is in control. Okay? And in John, in John 10, 10, it says that the devil came but to kill and to destroy, but I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So we have to realize that when we're going through this, we're going through trials for life. This is a serious matter that we're going through, and I'll stop in the through, and I'll let you speak. And just to add to that, it's funny that Satan is very smart. He has years of experience over us. So, when he can't get us in one way, he gets us in another. He uses our family, our friends, people that are close to us. And I don't know about you, but sometimes, not sometimes, most times, when I see, you can see the devil working. Sometimes you're there, you're praying, God give me strength, and here comes this person. The devil just using them. <laughs> and then you say, fix it, Jesus. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Because you can see where the devil is trying to tempt you. The devil is trying to, is like a roaring lion, like what this verse said. You know, trying to get you to that, that place where you know that, Jesus, that Christ is working in you and trying to get you away from. But it's good. It's a good thing that we rely on God's promises where he says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And every trial that we go through, we make it on the other side and we, we become stronger. So I hope that we all might rest on God's promises that saying that he will take us through the fire and we will come out victorious. Amen. I like that point, we're not to quit. It always reminds me of somebody in the Bible that though he was an old man, he just did not quit. And that was Caleb. You remember Caleb? Joshua and Caleb? He said, I'm capable, like when I was 40, or his 80s, at they are 40, to take that mountain. So he, he believed that God gave him the power and the strength that we are to do the same. The Lord is my strength, the rod of my salvation. Who should I fear? Of whom should I be afraid? But it's something that we have to exercise in our own. Remember the work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? I, I cannot work it for my son, my daughter. All I could do is, like Brother Nelson was reading, all I could do is pray for them, intercede for them. But we have all to make our own choices. I cannot make the choice for them, nor them for me. But something that is very powerful is the power of prayer. So whatever you do, no matter how low in your Christian life you are, pray. And remember what the sister just said. Pray that the promise is in your mind that he will never leave you, nor forsake you, no matter what you're going through. So always keep that in mind. Uh, and something that, that we always have to do is 
like the admonition tells us, is to resist the devil and he will flee from us. How do you resist the devil? By every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. We fight him with the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So when we put the whole armor of God, we're putting on Christ. Christ is the word of God. That's why the devil doesn't want us to study the word of God. He'd rather you watch uh, four hours of a soap opera or a movie than study a little Psalms 91, for instance. Or if you have problems in your life and you feel like you're guilty, he's not going to want you to read Psalms, uh, what is it, 53, I believe? I mean, 51 or 53? 51. 51. He doesn't want you to read the Psalm of Repentance. He doesn't want you to read especially Psalms 119. Because in that one says, create in me a clean heart and renew in me the right spirit. He doesn't want you to know these things. But we have to resist the devil with the word of God and he will flee from you. And, and that's a good thing. In Philippians 3.6. Can somebody read that for us? I should have said it before. Philippians 3.6. And this is something that should lift us up when we are going through trials, temptations, tribulation, when we think we're not good enough. Can somebody read that for us? Philippians 3, 6. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That's Philippians 3, 6. Huh? No, they're not in the wrong thing. <laughs> I'm looking for it. It says that he will finish what he started, the good work that he started in you. I thought it was Philippians. Maybe I wrote it wrong. But God will finish the good. Thank you, sister. God will finish the good work that he started in you. And you should never forget that, that no, matter, no matter what happens, you, uh, you might be looking at your brand new house and you say, wow, that's my house? And all you see is four boys standing up. But the Lord is building that house. You are the house of God. Remember that when we studied that? It's 1-6. One, oh, okay, thank you. It's 1-6. I don't know why I wrote 3. Okay, 1-6. Philippians 1-6. Can you read it for us? My bad. I wanted to get it right. Let me correct my notes. <laughs> okay. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good thing, a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Read the next verse uh, according to the brother here. Even as it is meant me, for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Now I get where I got three, six from. I got the response of my other note. I had an hour that said, he will make us perfect, establish, and settle. That will be Philippians 3, 6, okay? So he will make us perfect. Remember that it hurts me when even we Christians say nobody's perfect. And that perfection I explained before in one of the sermons is that it's obedience. And we sing about it sometimes, perfect obedience or perfect submission, you know? But when we say perfect, well, nobody's perfect. We become perfect in that crucible in Christ. Remember the part that I am crucified with Christ? Nevertheless, I live. Stop looking at yourself. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We have to look unto him. Because the devil continues to allow, or if we allow the devil 
to let us think in ourselves, we're going to be looking at a wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? And we're always going to be looking at the condemnation, condemnation, condemnation. And we're not to go in that crucible thinking like that. We have to go in there. Is that there's no more condemnation. There's no more condemnation. I am free from the law of sin and death. Because that's what Christ makes us. He's making us free from the law of sin. The law of sin is doing the negative of what God said. So the law of sin is death. Okay? Now, through all this studying, in John, 1 John 1, 5, 4, tells us that we know that this is our victory, even our faith. So when we're going through these crucifixes, like Brother Nelson was pointing out, of different crucifixes in our lives, we have to realize that all this is through the faith of Jesus living in us. When we are going through all these trials, temptations, we have to endure to the end. This is a battle. And that battle, sometimes we cry, sometimes we laugh, sometimes we rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. But there will be sufferings. There will be pains. Uh, somebody asked me, why am I going through these things in my life? And I answer that person that, look, maybe God is allowing you to go, to go through these things, like Paul about his eyesight, as far as we know, that he allowed uh, a spirit or Satan to buffer him up so he doesn't become so proud. Sometimes God's allowed things to happen in our lives, like why doesn't God heal me? Well, maybe if God will heal you for something that you might have, you remember the man in the temple that he said, Lord, that you've been made well, go and sin no more. So we have to be careful and realize that, wow, though I am in the situation, then we go to the word of God in Romans, and we say, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We cannot allow nothing in our lives to separate us, even though sometimes we do not understand why are we going through this. Just say, well, God is allowing this to happen to me so I could humble myself before him. And the day will come that there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. And we're looking forward to this because this is our victory, even our faith. Remember Job? Job was going through all these pains and sufferings. And he said, why? I didn't do nothing. But then he saw the righteousness of God as he looked into his life, and God is in control. So let us keep that in mind. Woo, that was good. Praise God. Here it says, I wanted to, be, uh, to read, I, but I'm not going to do it. I, I want to finish a, a little more into the eating of the lesson today. Please, please. In, in memory or in the facts of what we're going through, again, like Brother Nelson pointed out about different crucibles in this lesson, when you go home today, or you could do it uh, later, you know, when, like get the time to do it, and do it real slowly and enjoy, uh, savor, I believe is the word in English, savor the flavor and take a little time to remember the things that we're talking about, crucifixes and sufferings and all this. Take the little time and read Psalms 91 again. Amen. Not 119, okay? Amen. Unless you want to. That's my favorite Psalm, 119. Therefore, I read it. The longest one. So read Psalms 91, but read it. And enjoy what you're reading. Because you're going to see everything that, that is going through this. And when you are in these place, type places, God is there with you. The other day, I, I was thinking about you the other day, as a matter of fact, because of the, the, we were talking about the shadow of death. And I was looking at the son of righteousness. And you read that in Romans and you read it in uh, Genesis about the creation as a witness of God's power. And I'm looking at the sun, right? And I say, wow, we are in the shadow of the Almighty. 
And I'm thinking, I say, but wait a minute. There is no shadow of turning with him. God doesn't have a shadow. He's light. Then you look unto Jesus. Jesus is the shadow of God. And Jesus is light. So even the shadow of God is light. That's why we abide in that shadow. So when you read uh, Psalm 91, look at to where you're standing and you know, try to figure it out. Enjoy. Uh, have the dinner. God's food is good. Taste and see. For the word of God is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Oh, how can that be? It's for you to find out. And you will, then you will rejoice again with the word of God anew. Give it a new, you know, just a, yeah, there it is. No. Psalms 23, remember? Thou prepareth a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. That cup runneth over is the blessings that you're getting from eating in the table that the Lord has prepared for you in the presence of his enemy. Then you have to figure out who those enemies are. Because sometimes, the sister was talking about it before, even the servants of God themselves could be our enemies, telling us the wrong things, guiding us to the wrong way. So we have to be careful about the enemies of the cross. That's why we need to eat and taste and see that the Lord is good. Okay, there's a question on Tuesday's lesson. <clears throat> For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, what the sister was pointing out before. How can this be? The wrath of God. Whoa. Now, when you read, and I hope you did read it in, in uh, Romans 1, 21 through 32, and I just didn't skip that. And I, we're going to go back there again. If you notice, there's a whole bunch of sins mentioned there. And then it says, uh, Paul is saying, uh, saying, yeah, focusing especially on the stage of sin and its consequences. Why is he mentioning so many sins here? And again, if you... Keep reading, because you cannot just, even us as Adventists, we have to always read before and after the fact. You know, let us not say, oh, we are, we are who we are. We could be in a lukewarm state of mind. That's why we are in that crucible. And that's why God is pouring some fire in us, because he doesn't like lukewarm. And he, why do us be hot and lukewarm? So he keeps throwing it in there. For the perfection of the saints. Okay? Now he mentions all these sins here. And you might think, but why is he mentioning all these things in the going of the crucible here? Well, I was thinking the other day, and I said to myself, do you know that some people, not to mention names, use your imagination, they throw a nice parade. New York, it could be here. They throw nice parades and everybody so happy. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, they were so happy. But as I'm looking at and studying, it's not on the, if you keep reading like in Revelation, it tells you about other people with other sins. And I said to myself, wait a minute. How come the liars don't throw a parade? The homemongers, how come they don't throw a parade? And everybody that does evil, why don't we all throw a parade? Have you ever thought about that? Because everybody has different sins. And it just happened that this particular group celebrates their sin. And a lot of people join them and they agree with them and everybody happy. But if we walk through, throw a parade, everybody deserves to throw a parade. Because sin is sin no matter how colorful you, you, you dress it. 
So when then I was looking and says, all these sins are mentioned for the purpose of those that are that do the same, but different. Because sin is the transgression of God's law. So they're doing the same sins, but in a different way, because sin is sin, no matter how you put it. Okay? So we are not to judge when we are uh, doing the same. We might find ourselves doing the same, and then we're judging them for their sin. Oh, that guy is a liar. He's always lying. I'm telling you, he's always lying. But here you are, $429? Nah. And here you're lying on your taxes and, you know, doing other things. And yeah, we're, we're judging them when we're doing the same thing. Be ye separate, the Lord tells us. Be ye separate. Because God is going to punish all this. We went to the sanctuary, brother Nelson. I don't know if the Kaja called or Nelson. So when we go to the sanctuary, we discover that there will be a penalty for sin. Now, who's the one that kills and destroys? Be careful when you answer. Who's the one that kills and destroys and makes sick and heals? Read. We're going to go there. Read Deuteronomy 32, 29. I hope I got it right this time. Not like uh, Philippians. Yes, the Deuteronomy 32, 39. Now it says that all this has consequences that can create the condition of a crucifix. So somehow we wind up in this crucifix purification or destruction because of our own doing or God's leading. So we have to always think, how did I get here? How did I get in this trouble? Well, you lied in your taxes. That's why you're going to go to jail. Did God put you there? God told you not to do it. I'm just giving you an example. So what does it say? You want to read it for us, sister? Now listen to this. So it's Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Who was talking? God. That was God. I had to read the text, the verse oh, before. I, 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 so I did. I, <laughs> I did. I, I had did. to read that because I said, oh, let me see what it says, like I pointed out. When I tell you something, it's because I've done it. So I read before and I read after. And then you're going to discover that this is because of the sin of Israel. Because uh, the sin of Israel separate them from God. So God is telling them who he is. Okay? So when God opened the earth, it was God who opened the earth and the earth swallowed them. It was God who killed. But God was giving them an object lesson of destruction. The wages of sin is death. Satan is not the one that kills in that way. At the end, the word of God tells us that Satan himself will die. A lot of people think that Satan is going to be burning in hell forever and ever and ever. No. The word of God tells us that Satan will be turned into ashes. But a lot of people that the sister was pointing out, they come with a different gospel and twist the things to scare the people. But God is a just God. And when we read in Revelation, you're going to find out that his righteous acts have been revealed. And we will say, true and righteous are your ways. He's fair. So we always have to keep that in mind. God is a fair God. So, so you mean to say Satan doesn't kill? Yes. Satan doesn't persecute? Yes. Only God kills? No, 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 no. Okay, Satan so, does the same thing. So it is not only God. Yes. God has the power to kill because he has the power to give life. Mm -hmm. Whereas Satan can only kill, he cannot give life. Okay, very good, very good. Now Satan, what Satan could do is keep you afloat 
like the sister was pointing out, that, that prosperity gospel, okay? So he will kill you while you are alive. He'll suck your blood, so to speak, little by little, and you think you're living and having fun, while well, yet you are dying, you know? So yes, Brother Nelson, you're 100% right. Satan, the Lord Jesus said it, Satan comes to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly. So God is calling us out of darkness into his marvelous light, okay? He doesn't want us to be deceived by the enemy because the enemy does the same thing. Yes, sister. Good point, brother. And what I, what I understand, I stand to be corrected. The difference between God and Satan is that, yes, God punishes us, he might, he, but he does it out of love for us. The Satan, on the other hand, when he kills or when he hurts us, is to destroy us, and he comes from an evil place. God, on the other hand, we are his children, and as a mother that loves her children, and when a mother disciplines her child, she does it out of love because she doesn't want that child to continue doing anything that will harm, the, harm him or her. So God will discipline us, but at the end of the day, he wants us all to be saved. So I think that's a difference between God and Satan when it comes to what he's saying here. You know, it's all out of love. Okay. Even, even at the end of time, when we, are, we choose evil and we want to be destroyed, it will hurt him so much he will cry. It will hurt him to destroy us. But then we have the freedom of choice. We chose that, but we will still hurt him because he never wanted us in the first place to be lost. He wanted us to be saved. It's funny you're saying freedom of choice. I'm reading to the freedom of choice right in my paper because that's my note. It says, uh, on Wednesday, we're going to hurry up on this one now. Therefore, thus say the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them. Remember that crucible? Refine them and try them. And how shall I deal with the, with the daughters of my people? Well, when God tries us, we have something called the freedom of choice. So the freedom of choice is there. So we're not, even though Paul says I'm a prisoner of Christ, well, he knows what he's talking about. When we become, we become the, the prisoners of, of Christ. But we, God doesn't force us to do anything. He tells us what to do. But he gives us the freedom of choice. And that's the beauty. When we are in that crucible, when we're going through the trials and the temptations, like the sister was pointing out before that, you could be okay and there comes a temptation right in front of your eyes. What do you do? You still have the freedom of choice. You could be talking with... Uh, <sighs> with, with, with anybody, and at the same time, sin is talking back to you through that person, and in your mind, because you have the mind of Christ, you are, no, it is written, I should not commit adultery. No, it's, it is written, I should not kill, even though you want to kill that person. You know? So in your mind, you have to think that way. Now, we find out in various things that all things work together for the good, for those that love God according to the purpose of his calling. And Paul learned that through humility. Because if somebody could have boasted, it was Paul. But yet, he learned to trust in God. Okay? So he just did not say it. He was an example. So next week, Lord's willing, Brother Ron will be here. We're going to be studying the birdcage, a whole new lesson. Enjoy your lesson. Search the scriptures and find out if these things are true.